All right, awesome. So thank you guys, everybody, for joining us. Um, my name is Melissa here at Pura Vida Divers. And um, about this time of year in South Florida, we start to see Goliath grouper aggregating off of Palm Beach um, in potentially the hundreds. There are a ton of these huge fish, and they are amazing, really, to swim alongside. Um, we have Goliath grouper dives to actually get you out diving with Goliath grouper. Uh, throughout August and September, and then usually into the first couple weeks of October. Um, it's a hot commodity to go diving with Goliath grouper, so the dive charters are already really starting to fill up. If you are interested in diving with Goliaths and you haven't already booked your dives, now is the best time to go ahead and get those set. Save your spots, make sure that you are on the boat that's going out to dive with Goliaths tonight are going to learn from Dr. Chris Koenig, who's been a longtime Goliath grouper researcher. Um, he's studied these fish for a, a long time locally um, and has a, a ton of knowledge and information about them. Um, so let me pull up Chris's video and we'll get going. All right, I, I um, um, Chris Koenig, my colleagues, my students and I have working on Goliath grouper ecology and reproductive biology and behavior for the last, um, oh, over 20 years we have. And um, we've done work in Florida, uh, Brazil, and also French Guiana on this species. Um, uh, we've published uh, well over a dozen peer review articles on Goliath grouper and um, uh, we're continuing to publish. My student, uh, Christopher Malinowski, is, is, is still publishing papers. Uh, we've got more to do. Um, what I want to do today is to, as the title says, to show why it is a bad idea to open a fishery for Goliath grouper. There are many stresses that this animal is experiencing now that it didn't experience 100 years ago when the population flourished. And that's what I'm going to point out. I'm going to make it pretty clear about um, uh, the stresses and the potential increased mortality or the decrease in recruitment of this, uh, of, 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 uh, to this population uh, because of various factors. And I'll finish with the advantages of having a healthy, large population of Goliath grouper uh, here in Florida. First, let me, let me say the, uh, give you a general idea about groupers. Groupers are, um, there are about 163 species worldwide. There's 22 in the Western Atlantic. About 20 species are highly vulnerable to overfishing. And that includes three species that are endemic to the Southeastern United States. Goliath grouper, speckled hind, and Warsaw grouper. And you could probably add snowy grouper to that. Those, um, those last two species, speckled hind and Warsaw grouper, are deep, deep water groupers. So when, they, um, um, uh, when they're caught, uh, there's no uh, survival if they're released. And this is because of barotrauma. The swim bladders expand and they, they typically hemorrhage. Uh, but Goliath grouper can be released if it's caught in a moderate depth and, and survive. And we've, we've done that repeatedly. The characteristics of grouper slow growth, late maturity, great longevity, they all mean low production rates. Uh, many groupers form spawning aggregations, and that makes them easy targets for fishers. Uh, many use estuaries at nurseries, and estuaries, and we'll go into this in detail later, uh, have heavy impacts from human activities, both agriculture and other activities. And therefore, the nursery areas for these species that do have estuaries as nurseries uh, are, um, are, are uh, contaminated and uh, the production of the fish is reduced because of it. <clears throat> All right, the Goliath grouper we're going to be talking about is the Atlantic Goliath grouper. It occurs, its distribution is from North Carolina all the way to southern Brazil. Um, there's another species of Goliath grouper, the Pacific Goliath grouper, which was identified through genetic um, methods uh, in 2009 by Matt Craig and his colleagues. 
Um, there's also a population of Goliath grouper off the west coast of Africa, but the status is unknown because um, genetic uh, samples were not available at the time. Now, the, the, um, the fishery for Goliath grouper, it's uncertain when it started, but there are a lot of pictures uh, uh, from South Florida indicating that Goliath grouper was probably uh, fished or began being fished at the early part of the 20th century. And these pictures are common and there's many more like it. Uh, fishing intensity increased during the 1970s and 1980s and the fishery was closed in 1990. My personal experience in the early 1960s diving on the jetties of, um, of Palm Beach, I grew up in West Palm Beach, uh, it was not rare to see a Goliath gripper in those days. And, um, and I would see boatloads of them being brought in that had been power headed on reefs offshore. I personally witnessed that. So the decline, the really rapid decline in the Atlantic occurred probably in the 60s, uh, maybe in the late 50s. <clears throat> A brief um, uh, description of the life cycle of Goliath grouper. Um, males and females will share the same habitat as their home sites. Uh, they have very strong site fidelity. Uh, we've verified that. And um, in July, they migrate towards these spawning sites, spawning aggregation sites. And um, these uh, sites are traditional. Uh, and they're very predicted, predictable as to when and where they're going to spawn. So historically, fishermen targeted spawning aggregations uh, for the obvious reason that they maximize catch per effort. Um, the fertilization is external, and they, um, the larvae spend 30 to 80 days in the plankton up in the pelagic zone and settle out in mangroves, particularly red mangrove. And they initially set, settle in submerged mangrove leaf litter when they're very small, just a few centimeters in length. Uh, and they spend the rest of that uh, juvenile life to a meter in size uh, over five to six years. Um, and that habitat provides them with a lot of um, protection from predators and also um, ample food resources for growth. So that habitat we, we showed in a paper is essential to the production of Goliath grouper. And here's what, what it looks like. As I said, they remain there five to six years, but water quality is very important. Dissolved oxygen uh, has to be greater than three uh, parts per million, or, <clears throat> or what I have there. Um, milligrams per liter. Uh, salinity has to be uh, greater than five parts per thousand. So they can't survive in fresh water and they can't survive in uh, hypoxic conditions. As I said earlier, they form these spawning aggregations and the spawning aggregations are predictable in time and place. And that's why they were targeted by fishermen. Uh, the spawning aggregations that we have verified uh, uh, are off most on the west, on the east coast of Florida, or on, are off Palm Beach County, but they go all the way up into Martin County. And fish on, in those aggregations travel 500 kilometers up off from Georgia uh, at the extreme down to these aggregation sites in, uh, and, and start their spawning in August. In fact, right now around the new moon. And um, in the Gulf, they're more out on the shelf, although those, there are some that we discovered uh, more inshore. Uh, probably the deepest spawning aggregation is about 175 feet deep, and the shallowest is probably about 40 feet deep that we've found. And we recently found a, a spawning site up off of Apalachicola, the, um, the um, um, uh, St. George Sound, about 50 miles south of St. George Sound. So these aggregations are continuing to develop in different areas of the state. 
when the Goliath Grouper's population started uh, recovering, uh, a controversy arose. Uh, those who wanted to reopen the fishery and, uh, and those who wanted to keep it closed in perpetuity. Um, and there were many unsubstantial claim, unsubstantiated claims made about Goliath Grouper and why uh, a fishery needed to be open. Uh, and those, those claims continue. And it's funny that older fishermen um, actually welcomed the recovery of Goliath Grouper because as I experienced, they knew that, that they were quite abundant at one time. And, uh, but the younger fishermen who, um, uh, who just came into it after the Goliath Grouper population was pretty much depleted, uh, saw the recovering Goliath Grouper population as destructive to other species and to their fishery. In other words, they treated that fish as if it were a, an invasive species like lionfish. But in fact, they've been on Florida reefs for millions of years throughout the, their distribution that, that, uh, that, that I showed you earlier from North Carolina to Southern Brazil. This pattern is, ba is uh, reminiscent of the shifting baselines that Daniel Pauly described in 1995. That is, people recognize as normal what they first experience. And any change from that is perceived as abnormal. So in, um, um, uh, in that situation, uh, these fish are actually endemic to Florida. They're native species. Now, at the same time, the dive ecotourism um, uh, in, uh, in, in Florida, particularly off the east coast of Florida, and the catch and release fisheries were thriving. They were building. Um, and uh, uh, they have strong opposition, as they should, to reopen the fishery, as you will soon find out when I talk about this. So the main unsubstantiated claim given by those who wanted to open the Goliath Grouper fishery is that Goliath Grouper disrupt the ecological balance by indiscriminate feeding. They decrease fish abundance and biodiversity, and they prey on groupers, snappers, and lobsters, negatively impacting the fisheries for those species. Now for our scientific studies, which I said we have done over the past two decades, we did a lot of onboard sampling uh, of Goliath grouper. And here you see, we bring the fish up onto the deck, we tie it down onto a stretcher, because sometimes they get a little um, excitable and start throwing themselves around on the deck, hurting themselves and the people trying to sample them. So we, um, we sampled over 800 of these fish and, um, let me get this out of the way. Hold on just one second. 800 of these fish. And um, we sampled them for reproduction. That is, we sampled gonads uh, and took biopsies. Size, length, a, fin rays. We use, fin rays lay down rings, a, a ring every year, so you can age them with fin rays. Uh, we use stomach contents and stable isotope analyses to look at their diet. Now, stomach contents give you the actual thing that they ate, whereas stable isotopes uh, give you uh, an integrated view of what the animal eats over a long period of time, and it puts it into different trophic levels. It turns out that this fish is not an apex predator, it's at a lower trophic level. And we did a lot of sampling for muscle, uh, for health, uh, sampling muscle, blood, and liver tissue, and also for contaminants like mercury. Now the, um, the diet based on those stomach contents, and we used 363 individual adults to arrive at this uh, graph, is shown here. On the y-axis, you see percent weight, that is what the particular item um, weighed in total, uh, in percent of the total. And on here, percent occurrence, in other words, the frequency uh, at which it appeared in different individuals. If you look up here in the right-hand corner, you see that crabs by far blow away everything else. They, their diet is mainly crabs, although 
they will eat things like sea turtles and skates and rays and hermit crabs and whole lobster. But look at the whole lobster. They um, were only present in about two and a half percent of the stomachs. Uh, burrfish were more common. Uh, scad were more common. And fishing gear was quite common because they would, uh, of course, uh, steal uh, hooked fish or capture them depending on your point of view. So the species that they most commonly preyed upon were these box crabs. Um, some sample, stomach samples had as many as a dozen box crabs in, in a single stomach sample uh, of, of various species. And also burrfish. What typically remained of the burrfish were the spines and their bony, bony uh, tooth plates. Now, Goliath grouper are um, when they when they spawn, they're surrounded by by herring and scad. These are virtually all scad, so their diet uh, on scad is not surprising because these things just surround them very closely. Apparently, uh, these fish are egg predators. At least that's been described in the literature, and they're sight predators for eggs. So, presumably, they're in large numbers around the Goliath grouper to feed on the eggs. And that's one of the reasons that Goliath grouper feed on dark nights on a new moon. They'll, I mean, excuse me, will spawn on dark nights in a full moon. And they spawn um, uh, between about 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning, maximally. So it's very dark then. And uh, that puts these egg predators at a disadvantage. And we assume that that's one of the reasons that, um, that, they're, that they're always present during spawning. Now, we did these surveys uh, to answer the question whether species diversity and number of individuals, individuals were depleted uh, by the presence of large numbers of Goliath gripper. Now, reef is an acronym for Reef Environmental Education Foundation. Reef has volunteer divers that go out and they estimate the numbers of fish and they report this back to reef headquarters. And they do it and they still do, they're still doing it. They um, graciously gave us our data, their data and showed us uh, and we plotted it out and there's a gradual increase in the number of uh, species of fish relative to the number of Goliath grouper. In other words, as the Goliath grouper number increased, so did the number of species of fish. As the Goliath grouper number increased, so did the number of individuals of fish. It's a positive relationship. We did our own surveys, and, and these graphs are correspond with these, totally independent of reef, and we found the same pattern. That is species diversity or richness and uh, species abundance, uh, that is the abundance of individuals, uh, uh, increases with an increase in the number of Goliath grouper. Then we plotted uh, the uh, lobster uh, abundance in the catch uh, over the years from 2000 when the Goliath groupers started becoming quite abundant to present time. And in both cases here, total pounds of lobsters landed, there was an increase over that time period. In the number of pounds per trip, is, which is probably a more accurate measure, um, because it takes into account the number of trips, you also see a positive relationship here. So what mechanism might account for an increase in biodiversity and abundance of reef fish and lobsters? Again, remember, this is the exact opposite of what a lot of people thought was occurring. Goliath grouper, like red grouper, excavate sediment from reefs. What they do is they, they use their tails and they sweep out sediment that smothers cavities in the reef and different different places, little nooks and crannies, and it actually gives them a place uh, to, to hide uh, and, and be protected from predators. 
Um, red grouper use their mouths, but goliath grouper use their tails. During storms, sediments are suspended in the water column, and when they settle back out, they settle into these little places on the reef. Goliath grouper is one of the few species that can actually clean that back out again. So these little nooks are very important for, um, for species, uh, either for daytime species or nighttime species, uh, as uh, for protection. And we think that's a factor uh, in their um, relationship to changes in diversity and, um, and abundance. Now, there's a number of stressors on the Goliath grouper population. Mercury contamination is one. Episodic impacts from cold snaps and red tide is another. And destroyed, inaccessible, or polluted juvenile mangrove habitat is a third. And I'll go over these uh, in that sequence. Goliath grouper are heavily contaminated with mercury as high or higher than any commercial fish. And it's important to keep in mind that <clears throat> the most toxic uh, form of mercury is present in almost 90% of the total mercury within the muscle of the fish. In other words, when you eat a fish, 90% of the mercury in that muscle is the most toxic form, methylmercury. Um, when we eat mercury-contaminated fish, 95% of the methylmercury is absorbed through our digestive tract. Methylmercury uh, goes through um, biological membranes very easily. It easily passes. It passes from the mother to the fetus which is one of the extreme problems of, of mercury, methylmercury. It causes extreme damage to the human ner nervous system, especially in fetuses and young children. Now, comparing uh, the amount of mercury in, um, well, this is just total mercury, in uh, the various groupers, you'll see Goliath grouper here uh, highlighted across the top. Uh, the number to look at is the average amount of mercury. Micrograms per gram is basically parts per million. Um, and it, the average is 1.24. The next highest is uh, black grouper, which is 0.91. And so this is about a 35% increase over black grouper. Uh, the maximum is almost shocking, 7.6% mercury. So if you landed that fish and brought it home and ate it, you would most certainly have problems with that. If you compare the amount of mercury in Atlantic Goliath grouper with uh, those species of commercial fish that are the um, considered the highest in mercury, uh, it is right up there with them and a little bit above them. Here, for the Atlantic population, 1.228 parts per million is the average mercury concentration of 117 fish that were sampled. Again, here's that high number. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's a little bit lower, but it's still within the range of, of uh, the highest um, uh, mercury uh, uh, contamination among commercial species. Um, here, the FDA, the EPA, and the NRDC, and the Florida Department of Health all say to avoid these species, which basically have a lower mercury load than Goliath grouper. There's no advisory for Goliath grouper because it's fully protected. So where does the mercury come from? All right, there's um, several sources, coal burning power plants and factories that use mercury in their processes, uh, contribute mercury both, in, both into the atmosphere and um, mercury then becomes a global pollutant. It cycles through the environment for many years. Uh, ultimately, the vast majority of mercury enters the ocean. It comes into the ocean through rivers. It's also um, certain volcanoes will emit mercury. And when it gets into the ocean, 
these different colors show the amount of mercury, show the mercury, and this color is methylmercury. You can see that once it gets into the ocean, uh, bacterial action in the sediments convert a lot of the mercury to methylmercury. Um, again, that's the most toxic form. Now, methylmercury, because it can bioaccumulate, increases with trophic level, which, uh, which is why a lot of the species that are, uh, that are um, have the highest mercury levels are top predators, apex predators, like tunas and swordfish and, and, and their relatives. So we're wondering why Goliath gripper, which is not an apex predator, is building up so much methylmercury. Uh, my former student, Chris Malinowski, is working on that now. And it seems like some of the, their diet is fairly high in mercury content, and that may explain uh, why they have those high levels. Um, about 10% of the mercury enters the food web that is produced in the, in the atmosphere, and then the biomagnification that I just talked about uh, is occurring. What are the effects of mercury on humans? In adults, the effects can be delayed up to several weeks after eating mercury uh, or mercury-contaminated fish. There are nervous disorders. And it's also implicated in heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's. It's not to be taken lightly. The really insidious uh, aspect of mercury is that it affects developing central nervous systems, that of fetuses and young children. It, it produces um, um, irreversible brain damage. And also insidious is that women may be totally asymptomatic while the extreme damage may occur in the fetus. So all the uh, toxic effects of methylmercury are described in this list. Some extremely serious and some um, less serious, but certainly not to be discounted. So the question becomes, why allow a fishery to catch and eat Goliaths when it clearly puts human health at risk? especially that of innocent children? That's a question you should run through your mind. What are the effects on Goliaths of high mercury levels? Damage to the liver, gills and kidneys, damage to the central nervous system, and loss of viability of embryos and larvae. Now here is a, um, a graph showing the average egg mercury levels again in parts per million, and the female length to see if there's any increase in the amount of mercury in the eggs relative to the size of the fish. And there sure looks like there is, except for this segment here, it looks like an increase. And this is very interesting because old, um, old large fish are considered most important in terms of reproduction because they produce not only the largest quantity of eggs, they also produce the largest, the best quality of eggs. And, um, and clearly with these levels of mercury in the eggs, that's not true. They probably produce very poor quality eggs. Um, these levels here are so high that if you look in the, the literature at mercury and uh, the effects on, on embryonic development, these are way above the, um, the situation where embryonic development can damage can be detected. Okay, so I'll start now on the periodic uh, destructive events that occur in South Florida, like cold snaps and red tide. And then we'll go to the loss of functional juvenile habitat in South Florida. First, let's look at the trajectory of recovery of the adults. This is both East and West Florida on offshore sites. Now to get these numbers, since there is no fishery, these are not actually catch data. These are uh, data that are indexed. They are indices of abundance. And they're based upon 
uh, catch per trip in two NOAA programs. And they're also based upon the observation of reef divers that I talked about a little earlier. So you see this one here is the reef diver observations and the catch data uh, are here. Both of them increase up until a little about two, 2007 and then start declining. If you look at the juveniles, again, this is in the, the uh, juvenile habitat, primarily the Everglades in East and West Florida, <coughs> uh, in the mangroves, we have juvenile indices. And the Everglades National Park has an angler, angler survey, uh, which measures catch per trip. And again, there's a catch per trip for fishers who are fishing in areas like the 10,000 Islands and the other parts of the Everglades. And you can see the same pattern occurring, closure in 1990, there's a little bump here, um, and then uh, a, an increase, a fairly rapid increase, and then an immediate drop. And then it stays low, I mean, I think it's still low, it certainly hasn't recovered to this level, uh, out um, probably about 10 years. Or close to 10 years. Now these are the juveniles in the estuary. These are the ones that contribute to the adult population. They move offshore and they contribute to the adult population. By the way, these graphs come from the latest GAG stock, stock assessment, which was spearheaded by uh, FWC. So cold events, they're highly destructive because shallow water habitats where these juveniles live among the mangroves uh, is chilled very quickly. A Goliath river is a tropical species, so it can't tolerate temperatures much below 15 degrees Celsius, which is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. They can tolerate it somewhat below that, but only for very short periods. If it goes much below that, uh, it's lethal. The January 2010 event was most severe. Um, it should be um, understood that no recovery means no recruitment. That is, no recovery of the juveniles means no recruitment to the adult population. So any loss in the adult population uh, is not, um, uh, there are no replacements for those fish that are lost. It's not a sustainable fishery, in other words. <clears throat> now this graph shows I got to move this. It's in my way. All right. This graph shows um, the water temperatures, uh, the minimum water temperatures, not just water temperatures, but the minimum water temperatures in degrees C um, from about 1930, uh, roughly to about 19, oh, excuse me, 2014. So these are just the air temperatures. What you see here in this right graph, D, uh, is an expansion of the last 10 years of this series. And in that expansion, this dashed line is water temperature, and the solid line is air temperature. Now, air temperatures may go very low, but if they go, just say, overnight very low, then um, there's not enough time to cool down the water. And that's what's occurring through here. Even though they're below 15 degrees, then they don't have a lethal effect. But when they go much lower, down to about 10 degrees Celsius, uh, there is a lethal effect. And when they go down to about six degrees Celsius, there's an extreme lethal effect. Now you gotta keep in mind that um, cold snaps are, um, they're pervasive. They're everywhere, there's no place to hide. So if you're in shallow water, you die. And that's apparently what occurred to over 90%, maybe 95% of the juveniles during 2010. Red tides are frequent in Southwest Florida. And this is the center of Goliath group abundance. <clears throat> now, South Florida estuaries are eutrophic, which means they have too many nutrients. They're hyper nutrient conditions. 
uh, mostly nitrogen in the form of nitrates, but also phosphates, but mostly in nitrates. And these nitrates that form this eutrophic condition come from agricultural land, from uh, fertilizers that are put on lawns, from whole many different sources, uh, and they get into the water and they make the water uh, eutrophic. And this is a common characteristic of pretty much all South Florida estuaries. Now, although those eutrophic conditions do not initiate red tide, they increase the spatial and temperate range of red tide. So where they only existed in the fall in the distant past, now they exist in the fall through the winter and into the spring uh, in, when they're severe. Red tides of 2005 and 2018 were especially severe. Um, and one of the things that causes a lot of problems is the release of Lake Okeechobee water. Uh, and that's released into Pine Island Sound through the Caloosahatchee River and into the Indian River Lagoon as well. As well. And when these uh, eutrophic waters from Lake Okeechobee are released, they lower the salinity and they lower the dissolved oxygen because uh, plankton and bacteria can take advantage of these high nutrient conditions and um, during the nighttime, uh, they respire. During the daytime, they photosynthesize. But during the nighttime, when they respire, they drop the oxygen to near zero. Lots of Goliath grouper are killed by red tide, but nobody really has a handle on how many. It's not like, it's not like uh, as straightforward as juveniles in the mangroves. But we find them on the beaches after a red tide, so we know it's impacting the adults as well as the juveniles. So it does have an impact, and also has an impact on many other species, including bottlenose dolphin and manatees. <clears throat> this is, um, I believe this is Punta Rasa. <clears throat> the third characteristic that is a stress on the species and limits production is uh, extensive destruction of ma mangrove habitat in South Florida. Let's say mangrove habitat that's not available for juvenile goliath grouper or any other species. There's direct destruction. There's impoundment, particularly in uh, Indian River Lagoon. Extensive impoundment occurred in the past. Uh, and this was for control of mosquitoes, salt marsh mosquitoes. Uh, and, um, and there's poor water quality, again, due to eutrophication in these systems. The other source of eutrophication, especially in Indian River Lagoon, is uh, sewage waste. Now, it's been controlled to some extent, but it's still a factor uh, in the pollution of that system, and that's an enormous system. Um, so if just for example, if the oxygen in the environment of a juvenile goliath grouper drops to zero, even for an hour, they die. They have to have good water quality for five to six year period that they're in the mangroves. And here's a map that sort of summarizes our major uh, uh, estuarine areas around the state. These three, Indian River Lagoon, Lake Worth, and Biscayne Bay, all have uh, mangrove loss that is not available um, over 80%. And it's probably much greater than that due to eutrophication, that is the poor water quality that, in, that either periodically or generally exists in those systems. Florida Bay uh, over the past century has undergone many changes. Uh, there's a lot of nutrients that have been dumped into Florida Bay. In the 80s, there were sponge die-offs, there were seagrass die-offs, there's still bacteria, uh, excuse me, um, um, uh, plankton blooms there that deplete the oxygen. Uh, it is not a good place for uh, fish that uh, nurse in mangroves. Ten Thousand Islands actually had a 35% increase in mangroves. Most of them have encro encroached on salt marsh areas. Some of the rivers in this area are eutrophic, but generally the islands are very productive 
of juvenile goliath grouper and other species because they get flushed with fresh water and they're not eutrophic. They're fairly clean and the growth rates of goliath grouper are much higher on the mangrove islands than they are in the rivers, although they occur in the rivers, but they tend to move back and forth with the fresh water. Caloosahatchee and Port Charlotte are both contaminated by water that moves from Lake Okeechobee or is released by the Water Management District into Pine Island Sound. Uh, so any mangroves in this area, probably not very good uh, 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 juvenile habitat for any species, but particularly Goliath grouper. Sarasota Bay too. Now, Tampa Bay has made changes over the past um, uh, couple of decades. What they did was, and it's, it shows what can be done in est any estuary, and this is a paper, the lead author of whom is Holly Greening, um, it shows even the seagrasses have come back because they, they very, very strongly curtailed the amount of nitrogen going into the bay. And so the bay is approaching conditions that existed in the 1950s, which is just amazing. And it's wonderful. And it could be done in all these other systems if the political will were there to do it. This is what a release of Lake Okeechobee water looks like in an area at the um, near Pine Island Sound at the base of the uh, um, Caloosahatchee River. A real mess. So those are the, uh, those are the conditions that uh, have uh, strongly stressed recovery of the Goliath grouper population uh, and strongly um, um, uh, vote against any kind of a fishery, any kind of a take, because it won't be sustainable because of the factors that I just talked about. It won't be sustainable. So how did Goliath gripper contribute to Florida's economy? Well, as I said earlier, it promotes increases in biodiversity and abundance, and that's an, a benefit to fisheries, even though many people don't think that's the case, especially those people who haven't experienced the fish. Uh, and it is, the data are very clear that that is going on. They are native species, I'll say it over. They, they fit into the ecosystem. And they provide a strong attraction for the dive community around the world. Now, the dive community is, is, is very large. Six, estimate, DEMA estimate, DEMA is uh, uh, diving uh, equipment and, um, um, and marketing association. Took me a bit to remember that. Uh, Florida divers are willing to, in a study done by um, Scheidler and Pierce, divers are willing to pay $100 to $200, <coughs> divers from Florida that is, international divers $200 to $300 to see and photograph a school of Goliaths. This industry is expanding and it should expand even further. Catch and release charters for Goliath are increasing. And you can see the ads on the web for this. Um, the um, indirect revenues must also be considered. Say an international, say, say divers come from another country uh, and they come to Florida to see Goliath Group, or at least that's the main point of why they're coming. They stay at hotels, they eat at restaurants, they have transportation, they probably visit tourist attractions, um, and, and therefore contribute a significant amount of indirect revenues to the state of Florida, in addition to the direct revenues. Um, and the bottom line is that these revenues to Florida va are vastly greater than that of any recreational fishery. And the recreational fishery, as I said, uh, would not be something that, um, that is sustainable. And basically, you couldn't eat the fish because they're toxic. <laughs> now, from other countries, we see that um, divers spend a lot of money. It's extremely lucrative in some countries. The Bahamas, for example, 
the economy is enriched by over $100 million every year by divers coming specifically to see sharks and rays. Now, 25 years ago, sharks and rays were protected in the Bahamas. So now they're, they're available for this, for this group of divers that want to see them. $100 million a year. Worldwide, the industry is worth over $300 million annually. Now, the species that are involved in all of these ecotourism dives um, are, are typically seasonal, except for sharks and rays, like manta rays and whale sharks are seasonal. Goliath grouper dive tourism is available only in Florida year round, but it's most spectacular at the spawning time now. Um, but people can see Goliath grouper at any time of the year and they can swim right up to them. They're, they're, they're not afraid of divers. Um, so the question becomes, why continue to expend money on stock assessments and meetings for fishery purposes when Goliath ecotourism is a powerful generating, revenue generating industry? That is an important question. So to summarize, the Goliath group of population in the southeastern U.S. declined to near extinction in the 1980s, but was fully protected in 1990. Recovery was reversed in the mid to late 2000s by red tide and cold snaps in South Florida. High mercury levels in Goliath makes them unacceptable human food, and those levels are impacting the Goliaths themselves. Goliath reproduction depends on mangroves and good water quality, but South Florida estuaries are in very poor condition, so juvenile habitat is a small fraction of what it was, let's say, 100 years ago when the Goliath grouper population flourished. And the dive, the value of Goliath to the dive ecotourism as an ecotourism species is vastly greater to the economy than that derived from any potential fishery. So the proposal that we're making is that Goliath should join the ranks of sea turtles and manatees and being fully protected in perpetuity. Worldwide, there are about 6 million active divers. These active divers should be made aware of the dive opportunities in Florida with Goliath Grouper. The Florida Economic Development Council should work to increase dive ecotourism and Goliath should be their flagship species. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. That was very informative. All right, we had, um, we had a couple of questions throughout the presentation asking a little bit more information about um, how Goliath Gruber actually gets so much mercury in their systems. That's a real good question. We don't know the answer yet, but some of the, I'll just, I'll speculate. Some of the, the organisms that they eat are um, feed on bivalves, that is uh, clams and, and their relatives. Bivalves are filter feeders and they feed right near the sediment surface where mercury is converted into methyl mercury. Uh, some of these, um, and so if they continue to feed on these bivalves, they basically biomagnify uh, the mercury. Again, this is speculation, I don't know. Uh, but um, uh, if they feed heavily on these animals, which they do, and, and, and these box crabs are the same way, they feed heavily on those, uh, they'll be picking up a significant amount of methylmercury. And that's the dominant um, uh, mercury that is, form of mercury that's in their, their muscle tissue. Okay, excellent. Um, there was a question, are we disturbing the Goliath grouper spawning by being active divers while they're going through that process? Uh, I, I don't think so at all. And the reason I don't think so is because they, they spawn at a time when divers would not be in the water. That is from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning and on dark nights. Basically, the, there's a cacophony of booms during that period of time. I mean, I've recorded them and you'd be amazed. And I think they use, again, this is speculation. I think they use those booms to orient to one another 
because I'm sure they can't see a damn thing either. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, diving with them during the day, I hardly see how that would bother them. Um, uh, because a lot of times they won't, they won't even spawn on the site where you're viewing them. They'll go to another site and I, that confused me initially, but they'll actually do that. They'll move to a different site that may be a quarter of a mile away and spawn there. Uh, so no, I, I don't think there's any uh, impact on them at all from divers. Okay, excellent. That is good to hear as a diver. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So this is the other Chris, Chris Malinowski, and excellent job. That was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Koenig. Very much appreciated. Thank you. You're welcome. So my question is, so kind of going off the data concept and somebody brought up FWC and wanting to reopen the fishery or not, and then wanting to pursue more research. So my question is, what do you see as the, the gaps in research that still need to be answered for Goliath Grouper that are the, sort of the more important questions still, or has everything been answered that's relevant? Well, I think that um, one of the things we should try to figure out how mercury is impacting their reproduction. That can be done, uh, of course, I don't think it's, I don't even think it's practicable with Goliath Grouper. So you would use a model species in which you could, um, you know, um, uh, pass the methylmercury through the mother to the eggs and look at development. So I think the only way it could be done is with model species, actually. So that's one thing. In other words, is their reproduction being strongly affected by this uh, large amount of mercury in their eggs? Um, that's one, one question that needs to be answered. Um, I'd like to know the impact of, um, of red tide on them. I don't know how to estimate that, but that would be, um, that would be a good thing to, uh, to look into. Um, I'd like to look further into the direct effect of mercury on Goliath grouper, uh, 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 their health and their, um, their, basically their survival. I know that from your work, Chris, I know that there, there are more, there's more mercury in the males because the females dump a lot of the mercury into the eggs. Um, so some of the larger, older males may not appear in the population. In other words, they may have died off because of heavy intoxication with mercury. Of course, you know, things don't work that way. Usually what happens is they're extremely stressed with the mercury uh, and then susceptible to disease and other factors in their environment that, uh, that uh, increase their, uh, their mortality rate. Anyway, those are things that, that I think might be interesting to look at. Um, and uh, I, I really don't think a fishery is, um, <clears throat> is possible. I don't think it should be done because of the danger of the mercury uh, having, having, you know, having the effects that we know it will have if someone eats uh, these heavily contaminated fish uh, routinely, especially a pregnant woman. Very, very dangerous. Um, and it can, be, it can be checked too. You can, you can take hair samples which grows at about a centimeter a month. And you can look at the, the amount of mercury using these biomarkers that that woman ingested and come up with a reason why the child had some damaging effect. So these are, these are serious issues and they shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, and so, uh, and so I, I think I might've answered your question already. There and might be other a, things, that was, I don't know. Yeah. Well, so, so basically the, the, the answer is there's a lot of work yet to be done. And, and, and it sounds like mercury is still one of the, the things, of course, I'm interested in as well, that, you know, are, is going to be sort of the, a, big, a big unknown for how it's affecting their population on top of everything else that are fish in general are up against in, in Florida. Yeah. So it's good. But also, I'd also like to see directly if Goliath Gripper is surviving in any of these estuaries that I talked about in that map. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, are there any there? Uh, how big are they? How long do they survive? What's their growth rate? Things like that. That could be looked at. I don't know if they're there or not, but I suggest that they're not because of their long sojourn in those habitats and, um, uh, and, and the conditions of those estuaries are so poor. Uh, we had another question come in a little bit late in the game, um, but to your knowledge, have box crabs been tested for mercury? Chris Malinowski can answer that question. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, they, they have, and that data has not been published yet, but they have um, high enough levels where um, they're not quite, I think it, I, off the top of my head, it was around 0 0.3 micrograms per gram. So right around that EPA cutoff. And so a lot of their prey, somebody asked this question earlier, have fairly high mercury concentration, which definitely contributes to the accumulation in their muscle and liver tissues. But a lot of the other parts to the why Goliath could perhaps such high mercury concentration is because they're so long lived and, um, and they just end up accumulating mercury faster than they can get rid of it. So their livers can detoxify mercury. So their livers have the highest amount of mercury in their bodies, but it's mostly inorganic. So not the methyl mercury that Dr. Koenig talked about being toxic. So they can actually demethylate mercury, but not at a fast enough rate other than deposit it into their muscle tissues where it accumulates over years. And so there's a very strong correlation with age and, and length in Goliath grouper where mercury just continues to build up. Well, thank you for chiming in. That was very helpful. <laughs> um, so you mentioned multiple times that the money spent by divers is greater than that generated by the fishery. Um, has anyone, to your knowledge, studied the fishery to see what fishermen would potentially pay um, to see what the monetary benefit of catching something like Goliath grouper would be? Uh, there has been some talk, but I don't think I don't think anything was um, was finalized on how much they would charge. I, I think the 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 um, system that was discussed was a was sort of a stamp system where you buy a stamp for several hundred dollars and you bring in your Goliath grouper. Um, but unless you have a way of analyzing the mercury in the flesh of that Goliath grouper, I wouldn't suggest eating it. <laughs> and so this is. This is the conundrum that we're in. We can't catch them. What we would do is simply catch them to kill them. And I've heard it say that we need to control their population. That's totally ridiculous because, you know, uh, that is the height of hubris. We, we don't need to control their population. They've been around a million years and their populations have done quite well without us. <laughs> so I don't think that's even close to true. Um, let's see, do you have any thoughts on the mortality um, in Goliath grouper catch and release industry due to improper venting of the fish as they're bringing it to the surface? Well, it has, it has a lot to do with the depth that the fish is caught. If the fish is caught in, say, 150 feet of water, uh, venting isn't going to be doing much good because um, uh, if the swim bladder bursts, generally what you get after that is hemorrhaging. And once they hemorrhage, the fish dies. Now, if you catch it in less than, say, 110 feet of water, uh, then you vent it. Uh, they should, that's what we did. There's no problem. Uh, but you have to do it correctly. You have to hit the swim bladder with a vent. We use a trocar um, uh, to do this. Basically, it's used for, for cows uh, for, to, for, to eliminate or to alleviate bloat. And so what they do is they puncture the stomach with this device, and it has a sleeve, a cannula, and they pull the puncturing device out from that sleeve, and the gas comes out. And that's how we did Goliath Grouper, and they were fine. Because we dove with them. We saw them. In a few days, they were fully recovered. Okay. Um, we had a question asking if they were to potentially open a season on Goliath Grouper and it was um, set up similar to the season on Snook, would that still have the same negative effects on the Goliath population? Say that again, I didn't follow all of that. <laughs> Sorry, so there was a question basically saying if they were to open um, a season similar to Snook, 
on Goliath Grouper, um, would that have that those types of parameters still lead to the same negative effects on the Goliath Grouper population? Oh, sure. Sure. Basically, if you remove an adult, um, you know, you, you're, you're removing a fish that, I mean, let's say in mass, a number of them. Uh, right now, with the juvenile population being extremely low, you're not going to replace it. You know, I'm not talking about one fish. I'm talking about, you know, whatever a fishery would extract. Um, and so, again, we get back to the mercury issue. Why do that if you can't eat the fish? Okay, excellent. Um, we had a question asking, how long do Goliath grouper live? Well, the old, oldest one that was <clears throat> recorded uh, through otolith analysis was 37 years old, but that was not a very large fish. Um, uh, that was uh, done by Lou Bullock and his colleagues back in, um, uh, let's say, the, the early 90s. And, um, but I think they, they live uh, much older than that. That, was, that fish was brought in, uh, let's say, when the Goliath grouper population was pretty much close to extinction in Florida. And so the, probably the large old ones were, were uh, depleted from the population. I don't know, but I, I think 37 years is probably a low number on longevity. It's probably more like 60 or 70 years. I mean, red snapper can live to 53 years. <laughs> so, no, I, I think that's a low number. Okay. Um, do, to your knowledge, do most Goliath grouper carry ciguatera? I've never heard of any carrying ciguatera. Mm -hmm. Mostly um, fish eating fish like, like um, barracuda. And, and other groupers like, um, like uh, yellowfin grouper uh, uh, carry ciguatera. In fact, the specific name of yellowfin grouper is venenosa, which means poisonous. <laughs> In the islands, the Windward Islands, they won't touch them because the frequency of toxicity is high. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I, I, I've never heard of Goliath grouper, which is, you know, uh, you know, the focus is on invertebrates like crabs uh, as having um, ciguatera. All right, interesting. Uh, we had a question asking, where does the FWC currently stand on opening a, a season on Goliath grouper? I don't know. I, I think it's up in the air. I don't think it's been, I, I don't think there's any finalization at all on that. Um, yeah, so, and to our knowledge, um, this was obviously a, a topic discussed um, a lot recently. Um, they chose at this point to continue research. There were no policy changes made that I'm aware of. Um, but we can hopefully add um, maybe an online link. I'll look into that um, and include some more information from the FWC's website about this uh, when we post the recorded version of the, the video. So check out the Pura Vida Diverse Facebook page um, and we'll have some more resources there. Um, I am also about to post um, in our chat a whole slew of different resources if anybody is interested in learning more um, about Goliath grouper. Um, there's the essay, um, The Atlantic Goliath Grouper of Florida, To Fish or Not to Fish. Uh, there's an online resource to that. We also have a link to the video, Goliaths in the Stream. Um, and then you can also purchase a Goliath grouper pin. So that's something that you guys can do easily from home or when you're next in one of the dive shops to help support the research and, and help fund ongoing research efforts for Goliath Grouper. Um, that was a very informative presentation and certainly appreciate uh, your time tonight and all of your knowledge and research efforts. Um, if anyone is interested in diving with Goliath Grouper, uh, again, now is the time, as Dr. Koenig stated, it's a phenomenal experience. It's, it's really amazing to just be surrounded by fish who are as big as us. That doesn't generally happen every day in our dives. Um, so even though we see 
Belaya Thruper here throughout the year, being surrounded by a huge school of them is, is really something else. Um, so I encourage you guys all, try a dive with Belaya Thruper, get that firsthand interaction and experience with these fish. Um, it's truly unique and it's something that's really going to elevate your dive experience to a whole nother level. <laughs> all right, excellent. So I think with that, we are good to go. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Koenig, or any other um, resources that you wanted to mention before we sign off? I just want to thank all the people who listened. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much because um, because what I'm trying to do is put out the scientific evidence for these positions that I have and uh, or we have as a group and and not just leave it up to you know personal impressions or or perceptions about what might be going on. We rely on data. If we don't have data, we don't make <laughs> statements. We say we're speculating. So this is um, this is how we do it. So I appreciate everybody listening. I appreciate that very much.